Hello everyone, so I have a new project planned and I thought it would be a good idea to introduce the project in its own separate video because we have a lot to talk about and I don't really want to try and do chemistry after this video, especially because I think the first step is going to be a very long video regardless. This is going to be an organic chemistry project, which I haven't really done a, sort of a big organic chemistry project, sort of like a Nile Red or a Nerd Rage in, sort of, in terms of sort of chaining together lots of organic chemistry reactions to end up with a final product. I've done that a, a bit with the tetrazoles, if you can count that as organic chemistry, but and we're going to start with this question here because this is an apple, right? This, there's, there's nothing shocking about this bit. This is an apple I bought from the supermarket about a week ago. This is an apple from my tree in my garden. So I picked it about 10 minutes ago. So the question I want to ask, more than how do apples stay fresh, firstly, how old do you think this apple is? What's the difference in age between these two apples? How long ago was this apple picked? All right, have a guess, you know, out loud or whatever. How long do you think? You know, I got it from the store a week ago and it's still looking, you know, pretty reasonable. So we think a couple weeks, maybe a month, you know, since it was picked from a tree. Well, the answer actually is about 10 months on average, which is very surprising to me. And in fact, it's not that uncommon to get an apple that is over a year old. So even though it's like apple season at the moment and I drive to the store, what I'm actually buying is last year's apples, <laughs> you know, like from a year ago. Um, and this fact was really surprising to me. I thought, how does this apple that, you know, when I pick it up from the store is, is impeccable, how is that a year old? So now I have these two apples. If I left them out on the bench, within another week or so, they'd both be looking pretty bad. They'd start getting mushy and, you know, maybe two weeks I really wouldn't want to eat them. How can I preserve, this is an apple off my tree, so how can I preserve this? Well, a couple of simple tricks. Say if I spread it with pesticide or something like that, that would stop all the bacteria and sort of microorganisms from attacking it. And then also if I put it in the fridge, keeping it cold would stop it aging so much. Um, keeping it in the dark would stop it aging. And also if I, you know, if I'm an actual apple producer and I have the facility to do this, I can lower the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere um, and that stops them sort of oxidizing and aging too. So you sort of control the atmosphere, um, keep them in cold storage in the dark, and they'll last for a couple months, maybe four or five at maximum. But by that time, they might look good on the outside, but on the inside, you know, they won't be, they won't look freshly picked. And this was the way of, of doing sort of apple storage about 30 years ago, ever since we invented refrigeration, we've been storing apples. We never managed to get them to stay perfectly fresh. So to find out how this apple is still perfectly fresh a year on, we have to really understand how it ages. So inside this apple are enzymes, and that'll catalyze certain reactions that will break down the apple on the inside and start turning it mushy, make it sweeter, make it break down. This is all a natural process for the apple, so it's really what the apple is tuned to do. The aging process for the apple is a lot more simpler for, like, say, you or me, how we age and die, you know? It's actually only moderated, really, by one chemical, which I'm sure most of my audience will recognize as ethylene. This ethylene is really the signaling molecule for the apple. So when it sort of gets ethylene, it triggers all the enzymes to start breaking it down. And so you may have heard that the, you know, life pro tip or whatever it is, that you shouldn't store apples next to bananas. That's because bananas release ethylene, which catalyze the aging or not so much the aging, but the ripening of the apple. I keep saying aging, but it's really the ripening of the apple. So it gets ripe and then it starts, you know, it gets overripe and then starts to break down. So the major development of sort of storage of apples in the last 20, 30 years has actually been to completely inhibit the ethylene process. And that is through the wonders of modern chemistry. So we now have a chemical that permanently stops apples from aging. That's right, we've, we've cured aging except only in apples. My project is to synthesize the chemical that stops apples from aging, the anti-aging apple chemical. This here is 1-methylcyclopropene, or 1-MCP, or as it's sold under its trade name, Smart Fresh, because of course it is. You know, you can't call it 1-methylcyclopropene if you're talking about apples. You'd rather say, oh, we sprayed them with Smart Fresh, rather than, oh yeah, we just put some 1-methylcyclopropene on it. This is a chemical that inhibits the ability of the apple to send those ethylene signals. So it's an inhibitor for the ethylene. So this gets into the enzymes and, and basically stops them doing their, doing their work in ripening the apple. You pick the apple slightly before it's ripe. You put it in a cold, dark place with a low oxygen atmosphere and some of this chemical 
in the atmosphere because this is a gas and that apple will stay under ripe until you're ready to pull it out of the shed or wherever you have it send it off to the supermarket and as it's you know finally out in the world without this chemical in the atmosphere it will start to ripen by the time that the customer picks it up it's basically you know peak ripeness all right now i've introduced the chemical and its relation to apples what i'm going to do is i'm going to talk about the synthesis that i've devised for the one methyl cyclopropane and just basically one challenge or one difficulty i have for each step along the way. Uh, I, I won't be able to start the synthesis for at least a week. It gives us lots of time in the comments to discuss particular steps um, and what you think would be better ways of doing things and that sort of thing. Or I'm not gonna pretend to be some sort of organic chemistry genius. I'm not that great at it. How I managed to work all this out was through a computer software that was um, sort of accessible to me. Well, it's online, but it was accessible to me through the university. Uh, it was SciFinder or Reaxis, or it was one of the two. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to take a molecule and say, hey, I want to synthesize this. How do I do it? And it will scour the literature for preparations of this and will say, hey, you know, you can make it from this molecule or from, you know, a whole range of these molecules. And then you can take this molecule and, you know, plug it back in and say, oh, well, how do I make this? And then you keep doing that until you end up at a chemical that you, that you have or is accessible. And, you know, you can do that many, many times and develop different pathways. I like to think of it as computer-assisted retrosynthetic analysis. And we end up here at tertiary butanol, which is a common laboratory solvent. And I actually happened to pick some up um, recently. Oh, it's just frozen. It's been like mid-30s for the past week. So it's the first day I've, I've ever seen it actually freeze. That's amazing. Anyway, it's got, a, it's got a melting point of about 24, 25. It's finally cool enough for it to do that. This isn't always that easy to find as a chemical. Um, even though it's common in the lab, it's got no sort of uses outside of the lab. In America, you can just buy it offline, but in Australia, it's quite hard to find. I managed to find it at a, um, a science supply company that supplies to high schools and that sort of thing. You learn about primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols in, in high school. So they need a tertiary alcohol and this is the one they have. I won't give out the company name because I, they probably won't appreciate the publicity. And honestly, I was quite surprised they sold to me. And I think they were surprised that they sold to me too. But the fact that I could buy it locally meant I got it a lot cheaper. You know, basically less than the price it would have cost me to ship it from somewhere. And the first step is a real classic elimination reaction. We're using sulfuric acid. My knowledge of organic chemistry says that because this is a tertiary alcohol, it should eliminate... Um, fairly easily and you can do this sort of reaction with ethanol at 150 degrees so and that's a primary alcohol so if you go all the way to tertiary butanol it probably happens under reflux of tertiary butanol. The problem with this step is that the isobutene boils at 8 degrees so I'm going to have to find a way to sort of heat this up and, and you know catch this. The way to really do that is probably get some dry ice, which I can do, it's a little expensive, but I can do ice baths and stuff and get it down to negative 20 sort of maximum. You know, that's still only, you know, 20, 28 degrees below its boiling point. So it's still gonna evaporate a lot off, whereas at dry ice temperatures are way able to condense it and get this as a liquid. Now, the reason we want this as a liquid rather than as a gas is because the next step is we're gonna do a chlorination. I was quite surprised this works, but the literature backs it up quite readily um, that we're actually gonna chlorinate up here. The problem being is, yeah, we, if it's a gas, we can't really chlorinate it. I mean, industrially, you know, easy as piss, but um, in the home lab, it really needs to be a liquid for us to bubble chlorine through it. Chlorine itself liquefies at negative 34 degrees. That's testing my knowledge. And if we liquefy the chlorine, I'm worried that we're gonna over chlorinate it because then we'll just have a you know, um, really dense liquid chlorine at the bottom, which will just over chlorinate it. We'll start putting chlorines at different places and eliminate this double bond. So the way we're gonna get around that issue is I think if we use a solvent such as benzene or toluene, toluene this is going to chlorinate a lot easier than toluene is and we keep it at roughly negative 30 which is just above the um, boiling point of the chlorine and that and the solvent should help to dilute it to, to prevent it from over chlorinating and then once we have this molecule this molecule has a quite a good boiling point of about 78 degrees i think off memory so it's it's somewhere in the mid 70s so um that will be easily distillable it will be quite easily separated from any over chlorinated parts so it doesn't matter if there's only a little bit of over chlorination because we'll still be able to get this pretty pure we just distill this um out of the mix well i mean yeah just fractionate it you can then stop there you know i can store that with um you know 
a boiling point of about 78, you know, that's less volatile than acetone, so that's good. Whereas we can't really stop here, so this will have to be a quite a big day going from here to here. Next is um, a bit of a hard reaction that I haven't done something like this before. We have to kick off this chlorine and that will cyclize a molecule into our methyl cyclopropane. The problem is we need a super base for this. We can't do it with an ordinary base, we need a super base. So the easiest super base I can make is lithium amide, lithium into liquid ammonia and that will make lithium amide. That's the easiest super base I can think of making because I can get lithium, I can make ammonia, I can liquefy it. If you can think of it, a super base is easier to make, but they're not, they're not easy to make. The problem is, is, is water. So water will ruin the super base, also ruin this reaction. So I'll have to really run an anhydrous reaction, which I've sort of done, but you know, I've done very forgiving anhydrous reactions, but this will be a very um, unforgiving anhydrous reaction, I think. So that we'll have to have a video on making the lithium amide, also on doing this uh, elimination reaction. Hopefully what we should end up with, and I'm, I'm a little bit shaky here, is before our acid workup, we'll end up with a lithium um, that's deprotonated one of the carbons down here. So we'll basically end up with a salt of methyl cyclopropane, so lithium methyl cyclopropane. And then we could do a, an acid workup to do that. But what I, what I would like to do, I like this isn't really a testing channel, like I'm happy to make the chemical, but in terms of actually like stopping apples from aging, you know, that's not really my forte. You know whose forte it is? Cody's lab. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that if I can get the synthesis done, I can collaborate with Cody's lab, you know, excellent channel, blah, 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 you know, we all love him, whatever, whatever. Well, if I send him the smart fresh chemical, I think he would be interested in, in doing a project and showing its properties because I think it's an interesting concept about stopping the apples from aging. But it, this is a gas, this is, has quite a low boiling point. What I really want to do is this is, a, this is a solid and I could ship this to the US and then he could do a simple reaction to generate it basically in situ. Um, over the apples so you know if you added like a really weak acid that was maybe hydroscopic or even like I don't know something that was that would pull water with it you know it would slow this would slowly hydrolyze and release this as a gas so you could just have a sealed container with the apples and this thing and, and that would slowly release the gas and 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 basically slowly release it for you that's also why it's imperative to get water out here so we can stop at this thing and we don't push it all the way to here let me know your thoughts about the synthesis. I ran through that, I think, fairly in depth. So if you're still watching now, it means you're fairly dedicated. So <laughs> thanks for watching. A lot of these steps aren't very easy, but I enjoy it because I haven't really done so much hardcore organic chemistry, really pure sort of stuff. And this is, you know, quite classic in a way. Cool. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'll uh, see you around.